Okay, now the size and scale of different objects in the universe. Now we have a little bit of a appreciation for the light year, and we can start zooming out, t talking about how is the, what the scale of the universe is. So in the realm of astronomy, some of the smallest objects in the uh, solar system and uh, in outer space, they're like dust and rock debris. Then you got asteroids, comets, and meteors. They tend to be the next largest objects. And then the next largest objects tend to be moons. Moons, are, by the way, are also sometimes called satellites. Satellites, they're going around uh, uh, planets. We call our moon moon, but the other moons, we don't call them moon. We have a name for them, you know. So in general, the term satellite is also used. Natural satellite. They're natural satellites. Artificial satellites are the ones we send out, you know. Uh, then you got planets. Planets are the next largest. So if we look at this one here, it gives us a little idea. You see, this is an uh, asteroid, <coughs> famous asteroid called uh, Eros. Um, comes from the, the, the Greek love uh, god er Erotica, from which we get Erotica. Uh, Jupiter, we have a planet there. Let's see here. If you scroll down, that's the sun. Black hole. Then we go over here. Cluster of galaxies, Hercules cluster of galaxies. We get galaxies, interstellar gas. You see, interstellar gas and dust. So when I, when I was mentioning that list, one of the first things that I mentioned, rock and gas debris, so these are all the things that are in the uh, uh, universe. From these gas debris, you might start developing stars. Stars come from those gases. Gravity makes them collapse, and they form into stars. And then again, you s they show you here the sizes of uh, planets. And then you can see their size here. Uh, Mercury, Venus, just to give you a little. This one is kind of drawn to scale, so you can appreciate. See here, Mercury, Venus, and uh, Earth are like sisters in terms of size. Okay, Mars. It's smaller. Then you got Ju uh, Jupiter, Saturn. Notice one of the things, by the way, you're going to learn is that all the gaseous planets have rings. Of course, Saturn's rings are more visible, but a lot of you don't know uh, the other ones have rings too, but they do. Jupiter has rings. Saturn. Nep uh, Uranus, Neptune. And then Pluto. Well, you see how its size resembles that of a, a, a dwarf planet. Some, that's why we call those that. There are some moons that Jupiter has, right, uh, that are larger than even Mercury. So when I was giving you the size and scale of things, I said some moons are, uh, uh, the moons are usually smaller. That's not always the case. So how, how would you define to someone what's the difference of a moon and a planet then? If it's not their size, if planets aren't, are not always bigger than moons, then how do you define a the planet? The huh? The, planet. Uh, the moon. Yeah. yeah, a planet orbits around what? Yeah, that's the primary difference. A planet is a, an object whose primary orbit is it's going around the star. A moon's primary orbit goes around a planet. Its secondary orbit, it also goes around the sun. You see, moon goes around the planet, 
But because the planet is also going around the sun, the moon is also going around the sun, you see. So it's not the size that determines that it's a moon. The primary orbit is that it's orbiting a planet, you see. Uh, and um, after that, we get the galaxy. I'm probably going to end it about right there. Uh, so the galaxies are the next largest uh, entity, Milky Way galaxy, 75,000 light years in diameter. So now we start getting large things, 75,000 to roughly about 100,000 light years from one end to the other. And the sun is about two-thirds of the way from the center. Remember, I had shown you the, the, the galaxy picture earlier. So the sun is off to the side, two-thirds of the way. After that, we start getting bigger we start getting to something known as galaxy clusters, OK? For example, Okay, so the galaxy cluster that we live in is called the local group. So basically, when you come out of the Milky Way, you keep going, you keep going. Im envision yourself as if you're a rocket. You're coming out. Now you start looking back. This is what you're going to see when the, you come out of the Milky Way. You're going to see there is another bunch of small galaxies. You're going to see three large galaxies dominating the local group. You see, local group. Milky Way, M31, M33. M31. His uh, name is what? Andromeda Galaxy. It's a little bigger than us. So we're the second biggest galaxy in our local group. This one is the big one, OK, Andromeda. We're the second biggest one. And then the third one is M33, known as the Pinwheel Galaxy, OK? So we're not the toughest dude in our local group. There's another one. We're headed for a collision course with Andromeda. Andromeda, they're coming kind of towards each other. And then that's going to be millions of years. We're going to collide with them. And then after we collide, we have lots of different kinds of things happen. That introduces us to the topic of galaxy collisions. <laughs> you see. So, but it, don't worry about it. It's not going to happen in our lifetime. The size of this local group, 3 million light years. 3 million from one end to another. Imagine how big that is. Someone had a question? Each of them have a sun. Oh, well, yeah. Each of them have trillions of suns. Trillions of suns, trillions of suns, trillions of suns, you know, lots of them. And then each, a lot of those uh, suns have their own planet going around them. So is there intelligent life in them? Maybe. Maybe about one intelligent life per galaxy, you know. <laughs> So there's another person over there learning about astronomy right now, wondering if there's anyone else, you know. If we send a signal to them saying, hey, guys, are, is anyone out there? How many years is the signal going to take to get there? Imagine, 3 million light years. So from here to here, maybe a million and a half light years, right? Let's say a million and a half, 2 million light years. So if we send a signal right now there, hey, guys, anyone there? It's going to take two million years to get there, a million and a half to two years. They get it, and then they respond to us, another million and a half. Okay. We find out three million years later that there's someone there. 
and their message is, we're coming to get you. <laughs> OK, uh, have a good weekend. We're going to finish the rest of the lecture Monday. So don't worry about a quiz on Monday. OK, so we can get started. Um, remember last time, just kind of by way of quick review, we were going over the scale of the different objects in the universe. We started with some of the small things uh, in the solar system and in the galaxy in the universe, thus rock debris. Then we went to asteroids, comets. Then we went to moons, planets, stars. So generally speaking, this is kind of the order as we get bigger and bigger and bigger. Then we saw that the next big entity is called galaxies. And then, of course, the one that we live in is the Milky Way galaxy. And then after that, when you go outside of a galaxy, we ended here. So when you come out of the Milky Way galaxy, you begin noticing that the Milky Way is part of a, a cluster of galaxies. And the, the one that we live in is called the local group because it's local to us. But there's millions and millions of other galaxy clusters. So uh, we ended the notes with by saying uh, it contains two other large galaxies, the Andromeda galaxy, M31, M33, and then some of the small galaxies. The two famous ones are called Magellanic Cloud galaxies, large Magellanic Cloud, small Magellanic Cloud, <laughs> LMC, SMC, uh, they call that. Uh, those were thought to be the closest galaxies to us for a long, long time, but then recently, uh, in the 1990s, we've discovered a galaxy that's even closer than those. So these are famous, but then there are a couple other ones that are even closer. So we go to the next page of the slide now. Poor galaxy clusters contain few galaxies. So we can kind of divide up galaxy clusters into two major kinds, ones that are not very heavily populated and then ones that are very, very heavily populated. Poor galaxy cl clusters, they are not very heavily populated. The local group is an example of a poor galaxy cluster. So it's not very dense, as you can see in this picture. It's not very densely populated by lots and lots of galaxies. It contains some 40 galaxies, most of which are dwarf galaxies. Dwarf, we mean very, very small galaxies. So even though it sounds like a lot, 40, but it still goes under the category of poor. In 1994, astronomers discovered the closest galaxy to ours, now called the Sagittarius Dwarf Galaxy. So remember the other ones that I said, the Large Magellanic Cloud Galaxy, Small Magellanic Cloud, we used to think those were the closest. Well, now we now know the Sagittarius Dwarf Galaxy, very tiny, small little galaxy. But of course, in terms of light years, it's still a lot, 80,000 light years. Okay, so in this picture, if, we, if I had to put a little dot in it, maybe I would go and, you see, put a little dot right here. Something like that. So even though these two guys are still close, this is even closer. And then that would be the Sagittarius Dwarf Galaxy. So the, the Milky Way is about a 75 to 100,000 light years across, and then this one is something like that, so it's the closest one. If we are headed towards each other, then we will we'll engulf that galaxy, and that is called galactic cannibalism. The big galaxy cannibalizes and eats up a small one. Just like, of course, we have in the animal world, shark eats small fish and whatever, you know, that happens all the time. So galaxies also do likewise, okay? The big fish eat the small one. Uh, rich galaxy clusters contain thousands and thousands and thousands of galaxies. So if this was a rich galaxy cluster, it would be completely many, many, many dots, uh, lots of galaxies. An example of a rich galaxy cluster that is very, very rich is called the Coma Cluster. It is only 300 million light years away. Of course, when we say only, that's still a lot, very, very far, but... That's one of the close ones to us that is a rich galaxy cluster 300 million light years away. And of course, there's many, many other examples of rich galaxy clusters. Okay, now we go outside. 
Imagine again that you're in a trip, you're going outside, 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 and then soon this thing begins looking small to you. And then you see the next big structure. You see that thing that we used to think is large? It was three million light years across. That begins looking like a dot. It's called the local group. You see that little thing? Now we've come way, way far. And the next big structure we see is the local supercluster, okay? This guy is about 100 million light years across, okay? And of course, it's got a lot of other galaxy clusters in there. And then some of them are rich galaxy clusters, some of them are poor galaxy clusters. Amazing just to me how vast the universe is, you know? Uh, so superclusters are clusters of clusters of galaxies. And again, the one that we live in is called the local supercluster. Is the supercluster that our local group is in. It is about 100 million light years across. It contains other clusters, such as the Virgo cluster. <coughs> and it contains dark matter, such as the Great Attractor. Uh, one of the things that you've probably heard about in the news, or if you read uh, science magazines, is uh, there's this thing that we don't quite understand the nature of, and it's called dark matter. But how do we know that it exists? Well, because we can feel its gravitational pull. We can feel the gravitational pull of dark matter, but we can't see it. We call it dark. So I, uh, I really like that, that topic. I, I like reading about it. But the, the, the science of it hasn't really progressed to the point where we fully understand and grasp it yet. But we know its effects. So if you look at the local supercluster here, you can see the local group is here, Sculptor Group, M101, Ursa Major, Virgo. You see, Virgo is a rich galaxy cluster, huge. Lots of galaxies in there. And then other ones. And then in this region here, there seems to be a gap and a vacuum void of galaxies. But the evidence shows that these galaxies are being kind of pulled towards it, OK? So this way. So even though there's nothing, its gravitational effect is felt. And that's called the great attractor, okay? It's attracting the other clusters to it, okay? And what's there? Probably dark matter, you see? So um, <coughs> there's gonna be a report that you're gonna be, uh, that's gonna be due at the end of the semester. And that uh, report, you can choose any topic that you want to do research on. Throughout the semester, different topics will interest you. And you can start thinking about what topic you want to do further research on. And one of the ones that students choose is dark matter. You know, It's a good topic to do research on. Uh, someone had a question? Yeah, the way, it's a good question. He's saying, how do we measure if galaxies which way they're headed, which way, they're, uh, you know, which way their velocity is, and that they're being attracted. The primary thing we use is something known as a Doppler effect. Okay? And we will learn about that later on in the course. Uh, when something is approaching you or headed away from you, the spectral lines of that galaxy are shifted, either red shifted or blue shifted. So we use a principle from physics called the Doppler effect, and then from there we can determine which way they're headed. Uh, these galaxies. So good question. Yeah. Okay, and then <clears throat> we start coming outside of the supercluster. Even that begins looking small. And then the next structure we see are called filaments. Filaments are clusters or chains of superclusters. They are about a bil one and a half billion light years across and are the biggest structures in the universe. So next to the universe itself, this is about as large as a structure you can get. So a filament is a cluster of supercluster of a cluster of galaxies, you see? So uh, we can kind of show this picture here in the... <coughs> okay, so... This kind of reminds me of those Russian dolls that you buy. One doll is inside of another, inside of another, inside of another, you know. So if you start out at the smallest right here, Milky Way galaxy. And then, of course, the Milky Way galaxy, we're inside of it. And then it has the stars. It has planets. But then when you go outside, and then we can go the arrow this way. 
galaxy. Then we notice that the Milky Way galaxy is part of a cluster of uh, galaxies. We, our own cluster is called local group. And then we go this way. Then we notice that the cluster is inside of a local supercluster. It's one of the dots in there. And then the local supercluster, there's a bunch of superclusters like that. Then that's in there. And then this is the one that would, we would call the filaments. Okay, and then the filaments next to that, the next largest entity is a uh, galaxy itself. Uh, approximate size of galaxy, 15 billion light years, but it could be bigger, maybe 20, 30 billion light years, okay? <coughs> of course, question comes to your mind quickly is, uh, is does this keep on going, you know? <laughs> this is the universe part of another universe, which is part of another one, which is part of another one, and then that we don't know quite. We don't understand the nature of the universe, and is the universe part of another one, or does it end there? So that kind of takes us uh, to the next page uh, of the notes. The observable universe, which is this one right here, we call, I can call this observable. So that's what we observe. It's the largest thing that we know of. It is about 15 billion light years across. So that's because we can see the light coming from those stars, and we can study those stars. If something is outside of that, either the light hasn't reached us yet, or maybe there's nothing outside of that. So what's outside of the universe? We don't know. <laughs> you know? It's not like we can come out of it and then look inside and, and, and study it. We're inside of it. You know? It would almost kind of like uh, be the equivalent of a, imagine there's a little bacteria inside your stomach, you know, and then the bacteria uh, is wondering what you look like, you know, and what's outside of you. Well, the only thing that it knows is that little space that it lives around. It doesn't even know the structure of your stomach, your lungs, and everything, because it, it, the only the space that it occupies is so small. So in order for the bacteria to know what you look like, I mean, the, he, he can just, basically imagine it, but he's got to come outside of you and he can't do that, so, you know, he's basically very limited. Well, same thing as uh, we, you know. So, our entire universe, which is beyond the observable universe, might either be bigger than this, but the light has not reached us, or there might be other parallel universes beyond ours. So, the actual truth might lie somewhere in between all of this. Uh, what's the entire universe like? Well, either this thing can go on forever, you know, just keep going, the universe inside of another, that universe inside of another, that one inside of another, either it could be like that, or next to us, there could be another universe that has this chain of events, boom, 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 you know, like that. And then another universe next to us, <coughs> And then that's the concept of what? Parallel universes. You know, they all have galaxies, they all have clusters, they all have superclusters, they all have this chain of things happening, you know. Uh, and then even those ones, we don't know how far up they would go, you know. So your guess is as good as ours. Uh, but a lot of physicists, a lot of scientists believe nowadays in the concept of parallel universes. It doesn't, um, our laws of physics do not discount the possibility that there are parallel universes. It is likely. Um, and uh, <coughs> of course, you get there into topics of time travel. Can you travel from uh, our universe to another? You know, can you use black holes to go from our universe to another? Some theories say that you can, some theories say you can't. Uh, there might be copies of your, you in another universe. Now we're getting into Twilight Zone, you know. Uh, so life might be happening there, life might be happening here, but uh, parallel to each other, you know. Different things might be happening there versus you. If you go back in the past, can you change the past, you know? And then some people say, yeah, you can change the past, but then when you try to come back to the present, you come back to one of the other copies of the universe, you know. So 
you can you can you basically you don't come back to this one you come back into one of the other parallel ones so you can see here um, you can have really a lot of fun reading and uh, reading about this and thinking about it talking about it but uh, it's kind of some some of it is unsubstantiated you know um, one of the big reasons why physicists think that there could be parallel universes is because when they study the four forces of nature, the four forces of nature are gravity, strong nuclear force, weak nuclear force, and electromagnetic force. They find that the gravity is the weakest of these four forces. And uh, one of the big explanations why gravity is so much weaker compared to the other uh, three is that maybe the gravity is leaking out of these parallel universes. It does, it's not contained. So it leaks out and therefore it loses power. The other four forces, they are contained in the universe. So the, when it leaks out, as anything that leaks out does, it loses its power and strength. So you could read about this again. This is also another interesting topic. OK, the next final thing that we're ending the lecture one with is the concept of the not only how this universe is um, structured size-wise, but how is it structured in terms of shape-wise. And uh, what we are finding is that <clears throat> the universe is made up of a lot, of a lot of voids. I showed you one of those voids earlier when I was referring to the superclusters of galaxies. I said there's a void here, and inside of that void there is a, uh, what could be a dark matter. So. Astronomers now believe that most of the universe is made up of voids between all of these filamentary structures. So the structure of the universe is that it's got all these filaments, all these superclusters, and then in between them there's a lot of void area that is, uh, we don't know what's in there. These voids could either be completely vacuum or contain dark matter and are usually spherical and about 100 to 400 million light years across. Most clusters and superclusters are distributed on the boundary between these voids. So there's a void, 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 and then the superclusters are distributed on the boundary. And I'll show you a picture here. This is one of the famous, uh, one of the famous um, uh, uh, pictures that they have. This is called the ga uh, 2DF Galaxy sh uh, um, Survey. What they do is they have a super huge uh, telescope, span the sky, and then looking for pictures that come in. You know, the light that is coming in from very, very, very far away. Okay, so they just span the sky over years and years and years. Okay. And what they do is they focus on the pie shape of the sky, pie shape slice like this. <clears throat> and then they span the, the north side, and then they also span the south side. Okay? And then from that, as the light comes in, it starts making dots on the computer screen. And then what we notice is that uh, each of these dots are like superclusters and uh, um, clusters of superclusters. So you see here, dot, 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 and then you see the void, and then you see there's a void, void, and then void, 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 all of these things. So what we notice is that it's not uniformly distributed with galaxies and superclusters of galaxies. There are these empty spaces, okay, that we don't understand quite what's in them, okay? And it could be, again, that there's dark matter there. And then what's happening is maybe the dark matter is clumping together all these galaxies and saying, come, come, come. And then the uh, galaxies are going around those dark matter area, you see? So one of these long chains is known as the Great Wall. So this one here, the Great Wall, it's like this, this far. Okay, so most likely, it gets its name from the Great Wall of China. And so, so super clusters over here, all distributed throughout this way. And then on the bottom, on the south side, there's another one here called the Southern Wall. Okay, Southern Wall of uh, chains of super clusters, and then the Great Wall right here. So one of the things we would like to do, of course, besides just scanning and sh seeing the shape, is understanding why this happened. 
So that's basically the process of science is observation, okay, then try to come up with a hypothesis, wh how this is occurring, why this is occurring, and then we go back to the physics and the equations and stuff like that, try to understand, can we explain why they're structured like this? And then we go put our equations into the computer screen, into a program, and then we can say, okay, let the program simulate the Big Bang. <laughs> If, we, if our equations are right after the Big Bang happens and the computer simulation is happening, uh, then the computer will come up with a structure of the universe that looks like the, what we're noticing. If we can duplicate it, then that means we've understood why it's occurring. You see? And that's why the process of science is continual observation, going back to equations, and then now going to computers. The computer uh, has really helped us because then we can go test our... Uh, uh, equations based on computer simulations that we run, you see? <coughs> to me, this kind of resembles, the structure of the universe here kind of resembles what would happen if you took oil drops. So imagine you took oil drops and then you put them in water. And then when they go into water, what would happen? Would the oil mix uniformly in water? No, right? It would kind of clump together. The water would kind of be the equivalent of the dark matter. You see this empty space. And then the oil would clump together because it's attracted to each other. And then it would have that clumping behavior. So uh, the equations that they have to come up with has to explain why that's happening. You see. So one of these long chains is known as the Great Wall, and it can be seen towards our North Pole this way in the direction of the star Polaris. And we're about to start lecture two, so we're going to learn what Polaris is. It's our North Celestial Star, okay? And it is 500 million light years across, so the distance from here to here, 500 million light years across. There's a similar structure called the Southern Wall south of us. So North, uh, Great Wall, Southern Wall. Okay, so let's see what this shows. It's a different version of the picture that I just showed you. You see, 2DF Galaxy Survey. That's the name of it. So you can see here, this is our Milky Way. And then you're talking about, you see, uh, going out, out. I mean, this is really going deep into space, OK? And this is, shows you the, a scale, approximate distance. Let's uh, minimize it. Approximate distance, this is 200 million parsecs, megaparsec. 200 megaparsec. One parsec was how many light years? Might as well review for the quiz Wednesday. Three and a quarter. Remember it that way. Three fingers, 3.26, right? So 200 million parsecs times three, that's about 600 million light years. 600 million light years, 4 times 3, 1,200 million light years, 6 times 3, 800 million, 1,800 million light years, 800 times 3, and then up to 1,000, 1,000 times 3, 3,000 million light years. Ooh. Okay, so look at the picture coming in. You see the, the same, same shape? See the gaps here? The gap, that gap, the, those are the, all the voids. And these things are all the galaxies. The other thing it kind of reminds me of is our own bodies, the neurons and the nerve, the nerve structure, you know? You see how the nerve, you've seen pictures of the inside of our body, the nervous system. So it's almost like that, you know? Clumping all together. So the, the universe on the whole is a kind of a bigger version of our body, all the complexities and everything that happens, you know? Okay, with that, we kind of got a sense from lecture one of the size of space. We got an idea of what a light year is, what a megaparsec is, how to calculate distance to stars. Then we, we did the whole scale of the universe, and it gives you an overall picture. Now we go to lecture two. Lecture two, we come back down to the Earth, and we start discussing what space looks like from our point of view, and this is known as the concept of the celestial sphere, okay?